about trade and investment. We now move to questions to the Environment Minister, and we start off with topical questions. And I call Paul Frew. Mr Speaker, can I ask the Minister, has he any concerns with the amount of anaerobic digester applications, and in particular the anaerobic digester that will be fed entirely uh, by chicken litter in the Bellamina area, uh, which is the first of its kind? And can the Minister answer how he can justify the current neighbour notification system, which, which, which has caused a lot of concern and suspicion by the local community, and to what could be safe and progressive technology? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Thank Mr. Frew for his question. There are indeed quite a number of applications within the system for anaerobic digesters. I'm not familiar per se with the application, the specific application to which the member, however, refers. With the issue around neighbour notification, I believe that we do, as a department, need to look at how that is done to reduce and remove any room for suspicion or paranoia, paranoia among local communities about not just applications for anaerobic digesters, but any applications at all. Uh, on the whole, anaerobic digesters are something we should be supportive of, however, not in any place and not at any price. Paul Frew. Okay, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Is the Minister concerned with the lack of knowledge within the Planning Department on this type of anaerobic digestion? And is he minded to treat this uh, type of application like wind farms, whereby he would bring it into the centre of the Planning Department? Well, each application has to be treated on its own merits and judged on its own merits. The applications of wind farms, to which he refers, being brought into the centre, are generally Article 31 applications that are viewed as having massive regional significance. And uh, should an application for an anaerobic digester be deemed to be of that scale and of that significance, it will be. As regards a perceived lack of knowledge within the department on how to process these, that, that's something I'll look at. It's imperative that our planning officers are fully upskilled and fully aware of every type of application that comes before them. I am confident we have a very skilled workforce. However, technology changes, application changes, and it is vitally important. And I am determined that the plan and service changes to keep abreast of these developments. Oliver McMillan. Yeah, does the Minister fear that uh, single-tier legislation would make the taxi industry less accountable, considering everyone would be able to hail and ride? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, thank you uh, for that question, Mr. McMullen. The, the move towards single tier taxi legislation was due to be complete by September this year, 2013. However, with the agreement of the Environment Committee, my predecessor decided to postpone the implementation until September 2014. In order to give the industry and those within it time to prepare for the implementation so that its impact will be less onerous on operators and drivers and so it will be more affordable for them. As regards the implications of the move towards single tier on competition, I have met with several, several dozen <laughs> taxi drivers and representatives of taxi drivers and companies and heard many concerns and many views. It is a complicated piece of legislation. It is also an important piece of legislation to improve standards within the industry, to improve accessibility, particularly for those with disability. And I am determined that we use the year but that, that we have bought through postponing the implementation of this legislation to ensure that we get it right. And I am happy to work with those representatives of the taxi industry with committee members to make sure that we make it as effective as possible. Oliver McMillan. Can I thank the Minister for his answer? But can, can, the, can the Minister tell us, has any advice been sought from any other jurisdiction that have implemented a single tier taxi system to establish that it has been successful? As I have said, this piece of legislation is complicated. I believe it was actually the first piece of legislation, though, 
passed within this House, and the fact that we are here five years after its passage and it still has not moved anywhere is an indication of just how complex it is and how important it is that we get it right. There have been studies done of the taxi industry elsewhere. Every country, indeed most cities, have their own particular taxi needs and taxi issues. I think a case in point being Belfast, as we look in the north here, has been the place most severely impacted by the introduction of single tier and I suppose Belfast public hire and the fear that they have that the, um, what the impact might be in them. And I think, like I say, it's, it's, it's very important that we work together. I'll also be working with my colleague, the Minister for Regional Development, and issues around ranks and bus lanes as to how they can best be facilitated. Question number eight has been withdrawn. Sammy Wilson. Has the Minister any plans to introduce the daft and the economy-destroying idea of his predecessor by introducing a climate change bill for Northern Ireland? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank you, Mr. Wilson. I'm not sure that my predecessor had any daft ideas. He had. He, he did. He did have many daft ideas. <laughs> but but, may, but maybe not as many as some of my other predecessors in this place. However, uh, climate change is a massive, massive issue that we face, uh, regardless of maybe differences of opinion about its cause. At least I think we can now all accept that it does exist, and the need to do something about it exists also. Cl the introduction of a climate change bill might be one way to, to address it. However, I am not at this time 100 per cent convinced that it would be the best way to address it. Because I think what we do need is buy-in from all departments, from all members, from all sectors of the community, particularly the, the business community. And at this moment in time, I am more minded to favour a climate change strategy, where we get people on board, we get those who might have reservations about a bill on board, and just make sure that we get them all working towards reducing uh, greenhouse gas emissions, carbon emissions and making Northern Ireland a better place in terms of environment and a better place in the, the European and world level in terms of environment. Sammy Wilson. I'm not too sure whether the Minister is accepting that it was a daft idea and he's now trying to roll back from it, but I welcome at least his, his caution. Would he not accept that given the fact that uh, there has been no global warming for the last 15 years, even though CO2 emissions have been rising, and that the bill would affect farmers, businesses, job seekers and the economy in Northern Ireland, that it is much better to move away from regulation, additional costs on businesses through trying uh, to introduce such legislation at a time when already uh, we are struggling for competitiveness here in Northern Ireland. Thank you, uh, Mr. Wilson, for that supplementary. I do not, however, accept that regulation is necessarily bad for business. It is possible to create and strive for a better environment and a stronger economy, but it is why it is so important that I and that we as Assembly work with those interests that Mr. Wilson has mentioned, those in agriculture, those in industry, those in the agri food industry, particularly, which is so, so important to our local economy in order to address their fears, address their concerns, but I do not particularly think the logic that uh, Mr Wilson is espousing there is particularly helpful in doing so. I do not also or either accept that there has been no increase in, in global warming over the past 15 years. Trevor Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister, given that uh, NILAS targets are fast approaching us, does he believe that the North West application, given that it is the only one at the moment, is cap uh, capable of being the only solution in Northern Ireland presently? I uh, thank Mr Clark for that question. The issue of waste, how we deal with it, and the infrastructure that we have, or to date have not, got in place to deal with it, 
is again a very important one, a, a burning issue in some constituencies, one could say myself included. I have met with the North West Regional Waste Management Group, as I have met with the others, both individually and collectively, and in order that they work together, that we work together with them as a department, and uh, NILGA and local councils work with them to make sure that whatever solution we come up with to our undeniable waste problem is one that works. I thank the Minister for his response. And I do note, uh, Mr. Sp uh, Speaker, that he did meet the North West Group. However, um, the ARC Group for the east of the province uh, would consider an application in the Molusk area. Would it not be more viable in terms of a, a location somewhere in that particular area rather than, and I mean, I know my colleagues are particularly interested in the, uh, the ozone layer, but rather than, transporting, rather than transporting the goods from the Belfast area to the North West? As and when any waste management group supports a viable appointment business case to the Department, the Department will consider any case for funding on the basis of our assessment of the project's contribution to Northern Ireland's compliance with European landfill diversion targets. The ARC 21 project comprises a combination of mechanical biological treatment and energy from waste through incineration. And the remaining uh, Better for the procurement recently announced its plans for the new facilities in Molusk that must, to which Mr Clark referred and has been engaged in pre-application discussions with the planning service. Katrina Ryan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, there has been a recent damning report from the Commons uh, Public Accounts Committee in relation to um, Sellafield. And I wonder, is the Minister aware of this report and the dangers to people and the environment here in the north of Ireland? <coughs> I thank you for that interesting question. I will have to plead ignorance on that one. I am unaware of the report. I will make it my business to look at that report, to read that report and to study its findings. I am fully aware of Sellafield. I am fully aware of the public concern around the dangers posed to the public. and I am fully determined to do anything within my remit as Department as Minister for the Environment here to mitigate against those damages. Well, uh, thank you for the response. I am a bit concerned that your department didn't make you aware of the report and I welcome the fact that you will now go and study it. I would ask also that you make representation to the relevant authorities because it is a damning report and they are they're ten years behind in terms of safety and waste. Okay, I do undertake to make the, the relevant representation. I know uh, my party colleague, the MP for South Down, has been vociferous in her concerns and those of the South Down constituency around Sellafield. So I give you my guarantee I'll look at it now. Jonathan Craig is not in his place. Mr. McLaughlin. Mr. McLaughlin. <laughs> Good thank you very much, uh, Speaker. And to ask the Minister uh, if he could indicate to us how he intends to ensure strong uh, community and accountable community planning as part of the transfer of powers to uh, the new configuration of local councils. Thank uh, the member for his question, and, and I'll do my best to answer it. The transfer of powers to local councils is vitally important. We voted here a couple of weeks ago to pass the Local Government Reform Bill to committee stage, where it now sits and have actually have granted an extension to committee stage so that the committee, I'm sure Mr Boylan is looking forward to it, can spend more time properly scrutinising it and making sure it's, it's fit for purpose. Community planning is a massive issue within that. It is a massive opportunity within that to empower local communities, to empower local individuals to play an active role in shaping their own towns, cities and regions. The Department, well, through my predecessor, acquired additional funding from the Executive to provide training and capacity building for 
local councillors, but also, importantly, for local community groups and others who would be interested in and indeed vital to the community planning process. Members, that concludes qu topical questions. We now move to all questions of the Minister of Environment. Question number 1, 9 and 14 have all been withdrawn. And I call Michaela Boyle. Grandmother, can I call you a question ever a door? Question 2. Jurisdiction on the pro this proposal has passed to the Planning Appeals Commission by way of a non-determination appeal. As part of the appeal process, the Commission asked the Department to provide it with either draft reasons for refusal or draft conditions. The Department assessed the proposal based upon the evidence available to it and has presented nine reasons for refusal to the Commission. The Commission has now asked all parties to submit statements of case by the 17th of December this year. The Department is currently preparing a statement in support of the draft reasons for refusal. The planning appeal is to be dealt with by an informal hearing to take place on the 22nd of January 2014. By that stage, the Department will have received the statements of case from the appellant and interested third parties. The Department will consider the content of all these submissions, which may have an impact on the Department's assessment to date. Can I thank the Minister for his response? And does the Minister believe that the volume and nature of traffic that would be required to service this proposed anaerobic digester, uh, would it be conducive to the residential composition of the village of Cyan Mills? Na uh, Habere, I have actually made a site visit to the, the site of the proposed, the proposal to, to which this question refers, and have seen at first hand the road infrastructure in and around that site. Furthermore, I met with maybe a dozen or so objectors. In total, there are 337 objections that have been received regarding this proposal, and as far as I'm aware. Many of those, if not all of them, have referred to the traffic impact should this proposal go ahead. However, road service are a statutory consultee and will be responding and submitting their statement to the PAC now. And they will have seen the objections from the residents and be carrying out their own traffic impact assessment. Uh, Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Would the Minister agree that Cyan Mills is a good example of an industrial heritage village and that the tourism potential of having an industrial heritage project could be jeopardised if an, an anaerobic digester were to be sited in that village? Thank you, uh, Mr Byrne, for that supplementary question. This is again another issue that was raised by community representatives when I visited Cyan Mills on the 21st or 22nd of August this year. I am aware of the history and heritage in the Cyan Mills vicinity and I am aware of the determination of a group within that community to maximise, to maximise the benefit of this built heritage to Cyan Mills as a tourist destination. Therefore, I take on board the, the members' concerns and indeed the concerns of the community. However, again, it will be up to the PAC to assess these concerns. Lord Morrill. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Before I ask my question, could I declare the fact that I'm a member of the Sand Mills Anglin Club, yeah. which uh, fishes the River Mourne? So I want to put that interest on record right away. Uh, could I ask the Minister, I've listened carefully to his responses, and could I ask the Minister, does he not feel that a river of the Staten standing? and calibre of the River Mourne deserves special protection, and that uh, this type of development on a river that is so important for the migration of salmon uh, should be protected, and would he give careful consideration to putting a special protection on rivers of this nature? I uh, thank Lord Morrow for his question. And I, I, that day that I visited Sam Mills, there was a member of the, the Angling Club there who again expressed s some of these 
concerns. The area is indeed very sensitive in terms of, of conservation, not just for anglers, but potentially for other wildlife. However, on initial assessment, the Department deemed that an environmental impact assessment would not be required. However, I do know that, again, this is a case that objectors have raised and have made submissions to the PAC in this regard. As regards the future of the river, we will see how that runs, and I will certainly take on board Mr Morrow's concerns and look at that river and others, what's in those rivers and how they can best be protected. Question number three, Mr Speaker. The longest outstanding planning consultation response with NIA, NIEA is for application S2007-13720, which is for a mixed-use development in Lisbon. This consultation was issued to NIEA on 21 January 2009 following an initial consultation with Public Health. Johnson. I suspect that there are many other examples of three, four years delay for NIEA to respond to consultations. And this is actually gumming up the planning system. Does the Minister believe that there should be an, a, a, a requirement by not just NIEA but road service and other consultees to respond within a specified period of time, otherwise it is assumed that they have no comment to make, rather than holding up vital developments across Northern Ireland. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and thank you, Mr. Wilson. As a previous Minister for the Environment, Mr. Wilson is only too aware how this works and how, in sadly too many cases, it doesn't work properly and it doesn't work fast enough. A new duty for statutory consultees to respond to consultations within the prescribed time frame is something that I am looking very hard at and looking very seriously at as we move towards or move the planning powers towards councils. It is something that I will be aiming to pursue. Speaker, uh, can I ask the Minister or can the Minister explain whether any particular types of planning applications are prone to longer delay, and can he give the reason for this? Thank you, uh, Mr Gardner. Well, some applications are more complicated than others. There are various reasons why some consultations take longer th than others, maybe for previous land use. In the example I have cited, the longest running case, the previous use of the site had been an animal feed mill, and thus the ground conditions on the site must be subject to detailed investigation to establish their suitability for the proposed end use, which included residential. There are a number of reasons why NIEA responses can be delayed. Officers dealing with complex cases need time to prepare appropriate and considered assessments of environmental factors. Officers may have to undertake necessary investigations, studies and or evidence gathering before an assessment can be made and a consultation response prepared. This can lead to a delay in responding to planning, which may have a knock-on effect and does have a knock-on effect on the processing of applications by the planning service. But while there are many reasons, there should be no excuses, and there certainly are not any excuses for a response to take as long as this one has. I, have, I was shocked to see it. And have instructed officials to make sure that the response is issued by the end of this week. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The only independent member on the board of NIEA is finishing his term by the end of this year, and I understand he is not being replaced. Can I ask the Minister how he intends to keep that independent view in NIEA from next year? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank uh, the Chair of the Committee for her question. I actually had a conversation with the outgoing independent member of the Board of NIEA a few weeks ago, and uh, these are concerns that, that he also raised, and I believe that they were justifiable and understandable. 
concerns, I think it's, it's very important that there is more objectivity, that there is a degree of independence in any board, and a NIAA is no exception. It's something that I will be looking at as we move forward. The decision was made, the decision can be looked at again, and the decision can be remade. Question number four to the Minister. Mr. Speaker. Following the announcement by Ardsborough Council of its intention to close Explorus, I met with the member and a delegation from Friends of Explorus to listen to their concerns. At that meeting, I gave an undertaking to raise this matter with my ministerial colleagues and to task my officials with meeting with the Council to learn more about the details of the proposed closure. The meeting between officials and the Chief Executive of the Council took place on the 2nd of October, at which further information was provided as regards background to the decision, including previous private sector interest, costs and staffing implications. Information was also provided as regards the process and timescale for closing Explorers when the two-month stay of execution lapses on the 25th of November. On my direction, officials have since written to the Council, setting out a proposal for providing assistance to Explorers. The essence of this proposal is that one-off grant support may be available to help upgrade the facilities to attract more visitors and income, thus reducing the subsidy provided by the Council. However, this proposal is dependent on three factors. One, that the Council is open to this proposal in principle and is prepared to commit to explore us in the long term. Two, that the Council prepares a business case justifying the public expenditure involved. And three, that ministerial colleagues are prepared to assist in the provision of a one-off capital grant, provided that they are satisfied with the business case made. My department could not do this alone. The proposal will be placed before the Council's Development Committee on the 20th of November, and any recommendation from that committee will be considered by the Council at its meeting a week later. Alongside this, the Friends of Explorers have commissioned BDO consultants to help develop a business case for saving the centre, which they intend to present to Council in advance of that meeting. This is a positive development, and I have asked my officials to join any discussions arranged to progress the business case. Mr Speaker, thank you very much. And I'm prepared to listen to the, the uh, Minister all afternoon if he comes up with a positive response. Um, the question is, I thank the Minister for his reply and also for his um, efforts at the executive table to move this uh, very important uh, problem forward. Has the, the cross-party support um, for explorers that was given in this chamber last week has the Minister um, had receipt of any plans or vision for a sustainable future as yet for this priceless asset? And has his, has his department will assist will, it, will, the, will his department assist in regional funding to see explorers enjoy a, 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 a sustainable future? Mr Speaker, that's under enormous pressure to get this uh, answer to, to this, this gentleman. Okay, uh, th thank you, Mr McCarthy. Following the announcement by Ardsborough Council of its intention to close Explorers, I raised this matter with ministerial colleagues at the Executive Committee. As we are still in discussions, I am not able to say much more at this point, but we do still await the, the, a full and thorough business case on, from Friends of Explorers, from the Council on how we can save this much needed and much loved facility. My department and our potential commitment to future regional funding I cannot give in the absence of that business case. However, business case aside, I can state categorically that I would be committed to and favourable to allocating money to the seal sanctuary element of Explorus which performs a vital role. It is the only place in the north of Ireland that does such a thing, the nearest other one being Cork. The Seal Sanctuary was in the press again just today in terms of its value. And regardless of how the business case looks, my department will fund, will fund the Seal Sanctuary, be it in Explorers or elsewhere.
Cahill Boylan. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and, and the Minister for his answers to date. But could I ask the Minister, is he, has he allocated any funding in relation to the business case, and also what discussions he's had or aware of any other partners in relation to this project, be it Friends of Explorers or any other partners? I personally have not had those discussions. However, one of my officials has had many and continues to have discussions both with the Council and with Friends of Explorers. In terms of resources, that is what I have given. I, I have directed my officer there, and he is working closely and working well with both the Council and Friends of Explorers. Mike Nesbitt. Mr. Nesbitt. Mr. Speaker, thank you, and I thank the Minister for his, his answers. I am particularly taken by the, by the fact he suggests his department might be particularly keen to support the seal sanctuary aspect. Uh, my, my question is, therefore, are there various departments who might pick up on specific elements of Explorers' work, such as enterprise supporting tourism, decal perhaps looking at cultural areas that may expand, and is that the way to provide regional support from the Executive for Explorers? Well, that would and will be dependent on the business case. What we as an Executive cannot do is pour money or pour good money after bad into a black hole. There is a cross-cutting element to this facility. Obviously, it has an educational value, it has a tourism value, and in terms of the work it does with Queen's University, a role in further and higher education as well. However, in the absence of that business case, or until we see a business case, the executive would be unable to commit to, to that sort of funding. My seal sanctuary pledge, if you like, is aside from that. Question number five. It will be a matter for the eleven newly formed councils following their establishment in May 2014 to agree the role of a local government association on a future partnership panel. In the meantime, I have asked my officials to examine the Partnership Council in Wales, on which the Northern Ireland proposals are modelled, to ensure the Department is fully briefed on how the Welsh Council operates and functions. In moving forward, it is my intention to engage with relevant bodies, including the political reference group, before I present fully worked up proposals to the Executive for agreement on a future partnership panel. I will also be putting a position paper on the role of the partnership panel to the Regional Transition Committee meeting on the 27th of November, so that there is an informed discussion with the chairs of the transition committees who will be responsible for briefing the new incoming councils. The Local Government Bill, as introduced in the Assembly on 23 September 2013 and currently at committee stage, provides for the establishment of the partnership panel in Northern Ireland. Clause 106 requires the Department to establish the panel whose members to be appointed by the Department are to comprise Northern Ireland ministers and members of district councils. Before appointing district council members, the Department will be required to consult appropriate bodies representative of local government. The functions of the panel will be to advise the Northern Ireland ministers on matters affecting their functions, to make representations on matters affecting or of concern to those involved in local government in Northern Ireland, and also to give advice to those involved in local government in Northern Ireland. And I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, can I ask the Minister, does he agree that there are benefits to, um, to be had from a collective uh, corporate views which come from local government as a sector? Uh, Ms. McLaughlin. Uh, I am aware of the value of having a representative body, indeed. I, I told them that at the weekend, so I, I won't tell you any, any differently. I think the panel itself will have a very important role. Therefore, it's, ensure that, it's, it's vital that we ensure that we get the composition of the panel just right. 
It will provide a forum for discussion at political level on strategic matters of mutual interest and concern between central and local government. District councils and, indeed, their representative body have on a number of occasions raised concerns about the lack of consultation on important policy issues, especially those that directly affect them. The panel will not only address this issue, but also support the delivery of the Executive's vision for a new citizen-focused local government, particularly in the context of driving new initiatives such as community planning. Honour for McMullen. Mr McMullen. Question six. I am fully aware of national parks and the benefits that they can undoubtedly bring to areas, as they have done in GB and on this island. National park status is a globally recognised brand and, as a result, is a key draw in attracting tourists and ultimately boosting the local economy. Furthermore, national parks also have a role in protecting and enhancing natural heritage. However, I am also aware of opposition to national parks here in Northern Ireland and the concerns of landowners over what designation might mean for them. Given the level of this opposition, I do not believe that now is the correct time to proceed with national parks. I believe that some of the benefits associated with national parks can be derived from enhanced collaboration and partnership working on the ground between stakeholders including, importantly, landowners and others who have expressed reservations about national parks. This stance applies to the Causeway Coast and Glens and other areas. Oliver McMillan. Uh, can I thank the Minister for your answer? Can I ask the Minister would he now boldly go where has the, the previous Minister failed to go, and that's to a public meeting, and explain uh, the rationale what he's after telling us here today that now is not the time to proceed with the National Park, and would he also now take into consideration and withdraw it completely, as, it, as was done in the morns? I will uh, certainly be happy to attend a, a, such a meeting. I have received an invite from Moyle Council to attend a meeting on this very issue, but have to date been unable to schedule it. My predecessor also attended public meetings, not every public meeting, but I am happy to do so and to explain my rationale to mem or members of, of the members' community and elsewhere. Story. Trust the speaker hasn't forgot my, uh, my name so quickly. Uh, I thank the, the minister for his reply. And can he... Uh, take it from someone who represents the, the area that there is total and widespread opposition to the creation of a national park and will he accept that as one individual has described it, it is unnecessary expensive and dictatorial and that his department will now work with the farming community in North Antrim in a way which is beneficial to the environment rather than what was proposed which was clearly something which would have been to their detriment. Thank uh, Mr Storey for that supplementary. In my opinion, the reason that the opposition to national parks has been so strong and so vociferous is l largely due to fear and fear of the unknown. I will happily engage with, and my department will engage with, the farming community to which Mr Storey refers, but I think it is important that we do so on the basis of building partnership working on the ground not just the farming community, but also with those in support of national parks and who recognise the value that they can have to an area. It is important that this partnership approach is taken and that maybe, just maybe, sometime in the future, people's opposition might reduce. That is why I am not scrapping the National Parks Bill, but I am shelving it. Danny Kennehan. Very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer. He's um, answered much of what I wanted to say. But can we rely on that? That he's not giving up on the North Coast. He's going to find a way forward, which is both 
suits the environment, suits the farmers and the businesses, and finds a good way forward for everyone. I, absolutely. I remain, I remain convinced of the benefit of national parks. That has not changed. But I do have to recognise the depth of opposition to national parks and the difficulty of taking things further in the face of that opposition. This isn't something that we can impose in any area. It's something that has to grow from the ground in any area. Question number seven, uh, Mr. Speaker. There are currently no recycling targets set at local council level. The recycling targets associated with the European Union's Waste Framework Directive are set at member state level. The Waste Framework Directive requires that 50% of waste from households is recycled by 2020. Provisional data for Northern Ireland relating to the Waste Framework Directive target submitted as part of the UK rate shows a recycling rate for waste from households of 41.6% for 2012. My department also published a consultation paper in May 2013 seeking views on policy options for a recycling bill that would contain powers to introduce a statutory recycling target for a local authority collecting municipal waste. The proposal is to set a 60% target for the recycling of all local authority collected municipal waste by 2020. My officials are currently analysing the responses to the consultation and I will be considering that analysis before making any decisions on the preferred policy options. Robin Newton. I thank the Minister for his uh, re reply. Uh, can I just ask uh, the Minister then, what specific measures will the, the Minister take to ensure that the new 11 model council will indeed meet the uh, targets which he has just described? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again, Mr. Newton. Well, I think it is very important that I, as Minister, and we all, as members, espouse the value of recycling and the importance of doing so. I have just published the new Waste Management Strategy, Delivering Resource Efficiency, which seeks to change the focus of waste management from resource management to resource efficiency. What that really means is to use our resources in the most effective way to, to minimise their impact on the environment and to recognise the real value of our resources. In terms of upping the rates of recycling across the Council, my uh, department's Rethink Waste programme has, over the past few years, given out millions and millions of pounds in terms of funding. And where that investment has been made, we have seen improvement in the recycling rate. So I would like to do maybe a closer analysis of that and see where we have got the biggest return for that investment in terms of success in boosting recycling rates. John Dalt. Uh, Mr Speaker, uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. Does the Minister agree that some of the best examples of reducing and recycling have come from our schools? And is it his intention uh, to give that particular sector of our community greater encouragement because is not it young people who understand these things and then implement them in their adult life? I was just going to recycle my answer to the previous question, but I won't. No, certainly, education is an extremely important tool in reducing waste and promoting recycling and in doing all such things to protect our environment and our planet. That is why I have put quite an emphasis on eco-schools since taking post. I actually examined our list of eco-schools and uh, saw where we weren't doing well. I have written out personally to each of the schools who hadn't signed up, and as a result, we have had a massive, massive increase in uptake, maybe nearly 100 schools in the past month. So much so, my own constituency went from being the worst represented in terms of eco schools up to fifth place now. Questions to the Minister of Environment. Could I say before we finish question time that we have still some members over a period of a number of weeks who have not been in their place for question time 
and who has not come to this House to apologise or even to my office. And I would expect members who, for whatever reason, are not in their place during question time, at least either to give this House a reason or to come to my office and give a reason. Often city members of the whole House are very happy to listen to confessions here or confessions in my office around all of these issues. <laughs> Order members.